Okay, well, it looks like we're right at 10.15. So I think it's time to get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Just a quick reminder, this is web room number five. And up now our talk is Frozen, Can Freshwater Golden Clams Withstand Minnesota Winters with our presenter, Megan Weber. And just a quick reminder that if you have questions um, during the talk, please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. If it's not showing up, you may have to hover your mouse in order for that to appear. Um, and we hope you have lots of good questions for our presenter and we hope you enjoy this talk. Uh, take it away, Megan. Great, thanks, Holly. Yeah, I'm Megan Weber. Um, I'm an extension educator focusing on aquatic invasive species. Um, and I'm gonna share some work we've done with um, freshwater golden clam or curbicula fluminia um, here in Minnesota. This talk kind of brings together um, two different um, projects and collaborators that I work on. So I'll quickly mention that I'm working with um, Dan Sabulka from Sherburn Soil and Water Conservation District on the curbicula project and partners are, and then also our volunteer monitoring um, is part of a project that I work on with my colleagues, Dan Larkin and Pat Mulcahy here at the U. And um, I'll be sure to, you'll, you'll get to see their smiling faces during Q&A, but I wanna, I wanna make sure to say that um, it's not just me doing this work. Um, I am going to start by um, talking about what this species is. It's one, um, for those in Minnesota, um, you may not be so familiar with this particular invasive species. You can see a little video of it um, on the screen right now. Um, so these are freshwater golden clam. I am going to refer to them as just curbicula throughout this talk. It's um, a much shorter and easier name to say, but that's the, the genus that this particular species falls in. Um, and this, this uh, species has been regarded as one of the most invasive freshwater species in the world. Um, it has um, invaded across most continents. It's very prevalent in um, warmer parts of North America and Europe. Um, other other areas as well. Um, so it's it's a it's a species of note, but one um, that that we haven't really dealt with much in Minnesota to date. Um, they can grow up to about two inches in size across. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about their identification really quick. One of the key things that you'd be looking at is um, those those ridges. You can see it in the in the clams on the screen here. Um, I'll see if I can point. Um, they have these kind of a little bit more widely spaced, um, deep ridges. You can really feel them like with your thumbnail as you go across and um, the smaller ones, it's a little bit harder to see here, but you can you can see those even, even when they're in um, that smaller um, form. Um, they have this um, golden tan to brown color, but as you can see with like this one here, there's certainly some variation in coloration as well. Um, and uh, these ones in particular, they were, um, this is their foot, these little, this white structure here. So they're, they were just kind of moving about the container that we had them in when we had this. Um, the other thing is the shape of the shell to note. So they can easily be confused with um, some native mollusks that we have in Minnesota. Um, so in particular, look at this at this shell shape where um, it's kind of symmetrical. If you were to kind of like fold it across this line here, it'd, it'd do that. Um, and some of the other native species would have a little bit different shell shape where maybe like the hinge wouldn't be in the center, it might be a little bit off center, a little bit more um, oblong type shape or um, the rings here wouldn't be quite as pronounced, maybe a spaced a little bit closer together. Um, they have um, some interesting life histories. Um, they they can, um, when they spawn, um, they're simultaneous hermaphrodites, so they are able to self-fertilize. Um, this is different than some of the other invasive mollusks that we talk about, for example, zebra mussels, where we talk about you need at least a male and a female um, in order for reproduction to happen. Um, with this species, it is possible that one could start a new population, but they are also able to spawn um, across individuals as well. Um, and then the other piece has been um, for quite some time, they they were thought to have this lower temperature threshold of about two degrees Celsius and below that temperature, they really weren't thought to be able to, to thrive. Um, that's a big question mark right now um, where there's a couple of studies that have happened in particular in the lab that are indicating that um, they they might actually be able to tolerate 
um, some some colder temperatures. There have been um, some other reports that seems like they're in some areas that are colder. Um, so that, that was one of the big questions that we wanted to answer. I'll get to some of this as well when we go. Um, but as we talk about distribution in Minnesota, so you can see in, um, in the map here, that's just of the state of Minnesota, um, there have been known populations um, throughout the state. These have generally been limited to river systems. Um, and most often um, these dots represent like a power plant or a, a wastewater treatment plant or other raw water user that um, has some type of discharge happening into the river that's creating a warmer microclimate in that space. Um, so for example, you know, I think this one is the otter tail power. Um, there's a couple of power plants along the Mississippi here that I think these two dots are representing. I don't know all of the dots, but I know a couple of these populations are spaces where there's this year round warming of that water that happens due to that artificial um, temperature increase from, from situations like that. And in general, that's what these dots have been. These are all, all in river systems. Um, the other map here is from um, a study that was looking at um, potential impacts of climate change on invasive species distribution. And this is one of the species that they looked at. Um, so this map was um, kind of the present day as of 2012, um, where suitable habitat was considered for the species. And as you can see the blue, um, so which is all of kind of this space here is all blue. Um, that was the area that was considered to be not suitable for for the species. And again, like you can see the dots that they had here, which are kind of those those power plant or other other warming areas. Um, so Minnesota is is generally considered to not be suitable habitat for these species. And and in this paper as well, if you were to if you look at their other maps that they have for projecting out to 2080, um, a couple of different modeling systems they had for the climate. Generally, Minnesota stays out of those current models um, as, as suitable habitat. And in the in in the models that they ran, where it does, um, it's kind of limited portions of the state. And and even then, it's this um, this color that you see here. Um, which was under their most aggressive um, modeling plan to have it be part of part of a suitable habitat. Um, so what kind of changed and brought this story along is um, this event called Starry Trek. Um, I'm part of the statewide coordination for this event that um, is done um, with my colleagues, Dan and Pat with the AIS Detectors Program. Um, we partner with local organizations and agencies across the state to have this single day um, aquatic invasive species early detection event. Um, every year since 2017, there have been over 200 people who go and scour Minnesota lakes. Um, really, the, um, the pun intended star of the show is Starry Stonewort. Um, and but but those volunteers have also found other notable aquatic invasive species. So to date, they've found um, four of the, I think we're at 18 now, Starry Stonewort Lakes in Minnesota have been from volunteers in this event. Um, they have been responsible for the find of a few new Eurasian water milfoil lakes, a new um, population of zebra mussels, um, some other invasive species. But um, what the notable find for this story um, was this one. So um, this is Sherburne County, which is in central Minnesota. These are kind of the boundaries of the county here. And right here is Briggs Lake. Um, and one of our young volunteers found um, these two clams that came up in um, actually their aquatic plant um, rake toss um, were kind of tangled in with the plants and um, they recognized these as as a potential invasive species and um, brought them in for verification um, and that came back as sure enough um, this was curbicula in that lake um, so that was a really interesting find because as i had mentioned um, what we have known has been um, these river systems um, there are there are two power plants along um, the Mississippi River, which is right here, um, that that have these populations there. So it's it's not that far of a jump, but we haven't really seen these in an inland lake in Minnesota before. Um, so this was a really interesting find, um, and it brought up a number of questions for us. Um, those questions were like, are these clams surviving throughout the winter? We didn't know if those um, two clams were just kind of a lucky find. It was just two that had happened to make their way there that summer and that they were they would not end up surviving the winter. Um, how cold is it really getting in that lake over the winter time? 
is there reproduction happening there? Um, what what does this population even look like? Is it just a couple clams? Is it a lot of clams? Um, that that volunteer and his family actually had gone back out a couple of weeks afterwards um, to look some more because it got them very curious and and they did a few more rake tosses um, and found found a number more clams that came up. So that even got this question going more about what's what's really going on in this lake. Um, so. Um, I partnered up with um, Dan Sabolka. You, you can't really see him because this is in the middle of winter and we're bundled up. Um, uh, but we, uh, we, we've been working on this project now um, to learn more about what's happening with this curricula population. Um, so what we did throughout the winter, this was a year long project. We went out actually in October to kind of um, scout the lake and try and get an idea of where um, the clams were, and they seem to be pretty limited to this space around the public boat launch. Um, so in that area, um, we would go out every month, um, we would drill um, 10 holes in the ice in that area. Um, and you can see um, right here, kind of by Dan's feet, our, um, is our, our sampling tool. This is actually a D-net um, that we turned into a shovel with like a bag attached, basically. Um, some of the other more traditional sampling equipment. Um, we tried like an Ekman dredge and um, just found that the substrate here tended to jam it up um, quite a bit. So we were struggling with losing samples a lot. Um, the nice thing for us was that the water was actually fairly shallow in pretty much our entire sampling area. So we were able to use um, shovels and such. And, and this turned out to be a really great tool to use under the ice where we could um, you know, kind of scoop and everything would fall into that bag then and then we could bring it bring it up that way. Um, so once we drilled those holes, we would pull um, pull that sediment sample up. Um, we used uh, sieves to um, process the sediment and see if we could find clams in it. When we found the clams, we would record um, if they seem to be dead or alive, um, and then we would measure them. So here's Dan um, with the calipers measuring one of the clams. Um, and then finally, we took water quality recordings in each of the 10 holes. Um, and what we were trying to do here was to put that um, um, reader right at that water sediment interface to get the water temperature at that sediment level where the clams were living and to see what the conditions really were um, that they were experiencing. Um, in the summer, here we go, um, sampling looks a little bit different. Um, we we still are looking at 10 different sites, um, but it doesn't take nearly as much equipment to access them. Um, instead, what we would do is kind of just take our boat and motor across to the sites. And you can see here we would have these little um, marker buoys that we just kind of drop in as we went so that we could um, keep an eye on where, where we had been and where we hadn't been yet with our sampling. Um, same process, except we the, the um, water quality readings are just pooled um, because you, we don't see nearly as much difference um, from point to point um, in the summer. Um, so, so far now we've sampled, um, December was our first month out on the ice um, and we've been out every month starting in December. Um, we have one sampling trip left. I'll talk more about that a little bit later, but here's where we are so far. Um, you can see the map here um, of this public access. These are all of the points that we've sampled. Um, these kind of reddish dots are where live clams were present. Um, this yellowish colored dot like these um, are where there were dead clams. Um, and then this blue dot like these um, are where we didn't find any clams. Um, so we found them pretty much throughout the site. Um, there's a couple of spaces here, like you can see some clusters of blue dots. Um, there's a tree here, and this is also where there's a bunch of lily pads in the summer. Um, so that area gets, it, it, it doesn't have like that nice sediment. It's a lot more like detritus and muck, not as great of um, habitat for clams. Um, over here, there tended to be a lot of really big rocks that just made it difficult to sample altogether. So we could kind of get scoops, but they'd be kind of wimpy in regards to how much sediment we would actually get in there because these giant rocks just kept getting in the way. Um, so that the the couple of like trends that we noticed in these spots seem to be correlated to things related to the sediment maybe versus whether you know what what their distribution might be or whether or not they they're there um, or could be there. 
Um, so here's that's that's kind of where we are so far. Um, the coldest temp that we've recorded them at so far is just about zero degrees C. Um, I don't think that they were experiencing that temperature for very long. We recorded that temperature um, during a period of very heavy ice melt. It was when um, the ice was starting to break up and then quite a bit. We had lost a number of inches of ice in just a couple of weeks. Um, so I think that's likely because that fresh ice melt was happening and starting to mix down um, into those that bottom layer. Um, in the other months, that was the March temperature. So for example, in December, January, February, um, we were still seeing temperatures below two where we were finding live clams. Um, it was generally closer to one degrees C as opposed to um, this this near zero temp, um, but still um, cold and and definitely below that that two degrees threshold that's been reported. Um, and we have found clams in a variety of sizes, and I'll talk more about that as well too. Our biggest clam so far though has been um, 25 and a half millimeters, or that's about about an inch um, wide. Let's see. Um, we took the clams from the winter months um, and um, had this kind of afterthought. We were curious about what the distribution of sizes looked like. So pooled all the live clams from the winter and their sizes and came up with this histogram um, to see kind of what, what it was looking like. Um, we, we figured it was reasonable in the winter to pool multiple months of sampling because the clams aren't likely growing um, during that time. So um, this is what we found then. And you can see it kind of looks like we have a couple of different size classes here. You can see a couple of peaks um, that are coming up. And you can see a little bit more of the range from our itty bitties. Our sieves were a four millimeter sieve. So we generally aren't capturing anything um, below four millimeters because they would just kind of fall through as, as we process things through. Um, so here's kind of like the little tiny clams that we'd find. And um, this is that, that big one um, that we found along the way. <clears throat> Um, so now since we've started that, um, we've had some questions. So on, on the map here, um, this is that original find in Briggs Lake. Um, just um, a month ago, almost exactly, um, we held Starry Trek again for 2021. Um, and the Sherburn County site, Dan is the um, local coordinator for that. Um, added on some special monitoring for curbicula um, because we had gotten kind of curious about that. There had been dead curbicula shells previously found um, over here in Big Lake. Um, but even with some follow-ups from DNR in both 2019 and 2020, they had never been able to recover any live clams from that lake. So um, volunteers went out again in Starry Trek um, and found one live curbicula in Big Lake um, just uh, about a month ago. Um, there's been um, also some follow-up. Um, the city of Big Lake hires um, a, a consultant, a lakes consultant to do some aquatic invasive species surveys. Um, and he reported finding many, um, again, just dead shells um, shortly after Starry Trek. So our team went out um, just last week um, to do a little bit of additional searching um, and hopped in the water and, and to see what we could find. Um, and we were able to find in our uh, 15 live clams. So the ones that, um, in the hand here are some of those clams that we found while we were there. And we found clams both in um, the public boat launch area, but also right next to it, um, Big Lake has this wide um, swimming beach that's pretty sandy. Um, we found a couple in there as well. So um, it seems to kind of spread out a little bit further um, in Big Lake, and that's likely just, um, a, I, I'd say, due to what, what the sediment is like there, um, or what the, that bottom substrate is. Um, that area is also um, fairly regularly treated with copper sulfate for swimmer's itch, um, which I'd, I'd say is likely a reason that there's so many dead shells there and um, fewer live clams to find. Um, but, but we have now found these live clams and um, everything would seem to point to there being a reproducing population um, in, in that lake as well. <clears throat> 
Um, so that's brought us to what's next. Um, so I, I had mentioned that we have our final sampling for September. We're actually going out tomorrow um, to do that. Um, so in, in September, we will have um, our regular sampling, but we're also adding on this more um, intensive search. And what we're hoping to do is create a histogram like we did for the winter month one um, to get a good size distribution um, of the clams there and, and see what that looks like in the, in the summer months as well. Um, we don't um, get the same opportunity to just kind of like pool a number of months of data in the summer because clams are actively growing. So that would kind of muddle what that histogram might look like. So we really need to do that in, in a single um, sampling event. So we'll be doing that tomorrow. Um, we're also welcoming volunteers. So if anyone wants to come, feel free to reach out. Um, it's last minute, but, but you can sure join us out at Briggs Lake tomorrow if you'd like. Um, we will then, once we get that, done. Um, we will be um, getting our final results up, um, getting reports written and having things ready to go. So you have most of the picture here. Um, we're going to take, you know, that final bits of data, um, bring in the information that we were just um, getting from Big Lake and um, start tying that into kind of the bigger picture of, of what's been happening with curricula um, nationally as well. Um, and then the final piece would be um, something that any of you could do, which is to keep your eye out for curbicula. Um, now having found um, what seems to be reproducing populations in two Minnesota lakes, um, it sure brings the question about if there are others. And since this is a species that um, we haven't done a lot of education around in Minnesota because we've, we've always been thought to be kind of outside of um, its range, um, I'd say it's certainly possible that they're in other lakes and we just haven't noticed because it just looks like you know another clam in the water um, so if you do find one um, you can report those um, at edmaps.org midwest those reports um, go straight to dnr for verification um, so you you can do that um, and we'd appreciate that and feel free to send me a note if you if you find some as well because i'm certainly curious about if, if they turn up in other lakes i've seen I think two other um, EDMAPS reports now since that first discovery in Big Lake, um, or sorry, in Briggs Lake, um, there there was one, um, both of them have been dead shells. One of them was um, a small lake in Anoka County that's really just like a hop over a walking path from a known Mississippi River population. Um, so that one could easily be explained away as, you know, something ate it and had just brought it to where it was hanging out to eat or you know any kind of easy transport of a dead shell. Um, the other one was um, a dead shell reported in um, Lake Phelan in Ramsey County. Um, again, these are these are just dead shells. There haven't been live clams recovered at either of those sites, um, but it, it certainly brings that question of, of if if clams are there as well and and if they're in other parts of Minnesota, which I think might bring some additional questions about some of our modeling, um, in particular looking forward um, under different climate scenarios on what that might mean for Minnesota in the future. The last um, piece that I will say before I open up um, for question and answer um, is that if you're interested in getting involved and um, being a part of these volunteer efforts that lead to discoveries like this, um, we have ways that you can do that. You can check out our website. It's www.aisdetectors.org. Um, that has information about um, our larger volunteer program for certified AIS detectors that have this wide variety of things um, that they can do. Um, for Starry Track, which is just kind of that one day event that anyone is welcome to. To. Um, we have a Facebook page that you're um, welcome to like and follow and enjoy the content from. And also um, our, our YouTube channel link is showing up there as well. Um, so be sure to check those out if you're interested. Um, with that, I will open that up for questions and give my final thanks to our funders and partners as well. I had mentioned um, that Dan Sabolka and Sherburn Soil and Water Conservation District um, are real key partners um, to making this curricula project happen. Um, I think for both Dan and I, this project has been a very um, welcome activity um, during the last year of life in a pandemic and a lot of computer time to have this known day that we get to go outside and and be in the field. Um, and that project has been funded um, from the rapid response funds established by the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. Um, 
for the volunteer programs and Starry Trek. Um, thanks again to my colleagues, Dan and Pat, um, who, who help host that event with us every year. Um, and we, we started that program up um, with funding thanks to the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'll wrap up there and, and open up for questions. Thank you so much, Megan, for your wonderful talk. Um, let's see if we've got some questions coming in. Um, and I'll just read those to you. So our first question is from Shauna and they asked, when developing a rapid response plan, what are typical responses and suggestions for the species? Oh, that's um, a good question, Shauna. Um, I, I think the answer right now is that for, for Minnesota, um, we don't really know. Um, that's a question that um, I, we're, we're asking. I think we have a meeting coming up um, to, to discuss that with, with a broader group about what this might mean for Minnesota. Um, I think there's still a lot of questions about what impacts the species may or may not have for this state. Um, I think there's lots of questions about what kinds of um, management tools are available to us for the species. Um, and it's one, it's it's currently, there's um, a draft classification summary um, at DNR right now where it, it's proposed to become a prohibited aquatic invasive species um, that has not been complete yet. I'm not sure where where it is yet in, in the stage of, of review and approval. Um, but that that has some implications for what response could look like as well as what that classification will will ultimately become. Um, so I, I'd assume that like this project and these discoveries are going to start forming the answers to some of that questions or at least creating more questions that need to be answered to help answer that question. <laughs> Thank you. And as a reminder, um, participants, you can type your questions in the Q&A function, and that way we can get um, through all of them. Um, our next question is from Keegan Lund, and they ask, any plans to publish this data regarding a potential range expansion of curricula? Yes, um, there, there are. Um, I have been working on a, a manuscript as, um, as I can. Um, you know, until until the final data comes in. But um, once we get our final data tomorrow, um, we'll hopefully kind of jumpstart that and try to try to move to get that submitted as soon as possible. Um, I'm hoping to make that an open access publication as well. Um, so yes, there will be publications coming out. And then I'll also be working with MACERC, you know, as, as we work on, uh, you know, a more formal um, publication <laughs> on, on what um, other types of um, information would be um, helpful or, or other ways to kind of disseminate that aside from, from just say a journal article. Thank you. Our next question is from Gary Montz and they say, your temperatures appear to be single point in time temperatures. Is there any data or plans that might include temperature loggers for more continuous temp records over the winter to give a better picture of the temperature regime? Um, you are correct, um, Gary. Yeah, it's they are just single points in time. So we get, you know, this temperature when we're there in that one month. I think that's a really great question. And it's one of the points that we plan to make as kind of a suggestion for next steps on, on looking at what what what's actually happening um, with this species um, for for future for future research? So yeah, this one this one does not have that, um, but it it is it is a planned suggestion for future. Okay, I don't see any questions right now. So if you have questions, please um, enter them into the Q and A section. Um, but I have a quick question for you, Megan, and it's that. A uh, volunteer, you know, initially discovered that population in Briggs Lake, which is um, so cool. Um, but because this isn't well known throughout Minnesota and whatnot, um, are volunteers being trained on what to look for? Or was this volunteer just um, extra uh, prepared, I guess? <laughs> Yeah, um, so there there is a little bit of, of training that does happen. Um, we in, in our program, um, the AIS Detectors Volunteer Program, um, we 
um, we, we have a, a number of species that we train on. One of those are zebra mussels. Um, and when we teach about a species like that, we often talk about lookalikes. And we have talked about the species as a lookalike for a zebra mussel um, that someone might come across. Um, so it's noted that it, that we're talking about in the context of zebra mussels, but we, we mentioned that that's also an invasive species. Um, and those resources were provided to these volunteers at Starry Trek as well. Um, since that discovery, I've been trying really hard to, um, anytime I get the chance like this, to tell people about it and ask them to also look. We've, um, we've asked uh, at the lake associations where this has been found too, for people to, to search um, near their um, shoreline um, to, to see if it is has spread beyond that boat launch. We haven't really been able to find um, a spot and lots of that I think has to do with really just the substrate. We're also not finding a lot of great substrate for them when we've gone and kind of sampled areas beyond. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, we have another question from Keegan Lund, and they ask, in terms of early detection as a small critter, is the only way to find this through sediment sampling? Um, so no, and I'll say ironically, both times our volunteers have found this, it has not been through sediment sampling, it's been with an aquatic plant sampling rake. So they've actually been searching for invasive aquatic plants. Um, and the live curricula have come up tangled up in those plants. Um, the work that we've done afterwards um, has been sediment sampling um, with, you know, like I mentioned with, with that D-net or in Big Lake, we just hopped in the water um, with our sieves and just started, you know, scooping to see what we could find. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely interesting. And, and with the 2021 um, survey um, that Sherburn Hill and Water Conservation District um, had added on to their Starry Trek site, they had actually provided sieves and ways for people to scoop sediment. Um, and yet that live clam did not come up using the protocols for the clam, it came up in the plant rake. Um, so I'm not sure what that means, but it, it's certainly interesting that that's the way that this has been discovered both times so far. Yeah, that is interesting <laughs> that you're finding them in the plant rakes. We've got another question here from Ken. And it says, have you reached out to recreational divers as volunteers? Oh, that's a really great thought. You know, we have not um, as of yet, but that's another really great group to at least mention to, to be aware, um, to be aware of that as, as it's certainly something that they, they might see as they're exploring. So that's a, that's a really great suggestion of another group to kind of get this information out to, to, to just be on the lookout for as they're, they're out and enjoying Minnesota waters under the surface. All right, it looks like most of the questions are answered for now. Does anyone else have a question? Please feel free to type that into the Q&A function. Um, I'll give you guys a little bit of time to type those questions if you have any last thoughts. Um, but Megan, is there any um, places that people should be looking in particular um, if they are interested in checking their boat launches or lakes of interest? Um, sure. Yeah, so um, so they the the clams really prefer um, like really nice sandy areas. So if um, you know there's a public launch, a swimming area, um, your shoreline that has that sandy space, um, that's a great place to to search. Um, you do not need fancy tools, as I mentioned. You you may just find them with the aquatic plant sampling rake. Um, you can also use, you know, just like a shovel if you would like to kind of scoop it up. Um, you could use a kitchen strainer to help, you know, get rid of the sand and look for clams. Um, so yeah, you don't you don't necessarily need um, any of the fancy tools to do that, and those would be a way that you could just kind of explore. Um, and you're likely to find some other, you know, like just fun things um, as, as you do that as well. So if you if you do have an interest in searching more, those are some ways that you can do that in at least like those shallow spaces where there's that sandy substrate. Great. We have another 
question from Keegan. Yes, keep asking away. Um, they asked, Megan, can you speak briefly to the known impacts of this species and also the nuances of response efforts? For example, just because a species is invasive does not necessarily mean that a response would be warranted. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Those are really great points. Um, so I, I like I had mentioned that there's still a lot of questions about what impacts there might be for the species in Minnesota. So even if we do this work and we find that Minnesota is, is a more suitable habitat than we had thought, um, it's still going to likely be kind of at the edge of the tolerance for the species. Um, so that might mean that um, at, at least for now, um, we're not likely to see impacts from it. That's 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 totally a possibility. Um, I think we do need to think about um, invasions like this in the context of a changing climate as well. So I think some of those, um, you know, adapting climate models might be important to think about. Kind of what's the likelihood of seeing broader impacts from the species as opposed to, um, you know, kind of having a, a smaller, less um, nuisance population. Um, the, one of the biggest impacts for this species is, is biofouling. Um, it, um, the, the power plants that I had mentioned, um, some of the power plants in Minnesota where they have these, where that warming or that cooling water, sorry, is discharged, um, have to spend a decent amount of money um, doing control for this species. Um, so um, it's not like zebra mussels where, um, you know, zebra mussels will like attach on to infrastructure um, so much as like you just get this huge mass of shells that can cause clogging and problems um, and fill, you know, like strainer baskets or whatever you might have. Um, so, so you see a, the, the biofouling is, is a big primary impact. Um, like zebra mussels, they're filter feeders. Um, so there's certainly um, potential for impacts um, to the food web in, in that sense as well, um, potential for um, you know, competing with some native species. But yeah, I think, I think those are all really good questions um, about what, you know, what, what will we see in Minnesota. Um, and yeah, in terms of response, um, I, I'd agree that you know, it, just because there's something that is um, that can be invasive is present that doesn't necessarily mean um, that a treatment is needed. Um, I, there's there's a lot of pros and cons that you should weigh. Um, just about any treatment method is going to have some kind of impact um, to native species in some form. Um, so I, I think you need to carefully weigh the pros of treatment with the potential negatives um, before you know, taking that kind of action. Um, so, so yeah, those, those are certainly things to consider as well. Yes, thank you for elaborating on that, Megan. Well, we're just about um, at time. So a final reminder to insert your questions into the Q&A if you have those. Um, as a reminder, our next talk doesn't start until 11.15. So there is a little bit of a break between talks. If you'd like to remain in this room, which is web room number five, um, the next talk, again, starting at 11.15 is improving the efficiency of watercraft inspections. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to check out talks in other web rooms as well. I'm not seeing any further questions come in. Is there anything else you wanted to say, Megan? Uh, no, I, I think that that covers all of it. So thanks everyone for coming and listening for all the wonderful questions. Um, and I'm, I'm looking more forward to no, finishing this up and, and seeing where the next steps go with, with this project and, you know, what the future research could be around it. Thank you, Megan, for the wonderful talk. We already have um, some questions coming in. So thank you all for your participation. If you still want to ask a question, remember to use that Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. And uh, yeah, let's get to it.
So our first question um, is, do you have any idea how long um, they have been in these lakes and have they began to impact the ecology of the lakes at all? That is a great question. Um, no, I have no idea how long they've been there. Um, presumably for at least a few years, uh, like I said, the, the first dead shells in Big Lake were found in 2019. Um, so yeah, sometime before 2019 for Big Lake and, and who knows for Briggs Lake how long they've been there. There's certainly plenty of, of clams there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question again, since it's kind of one of these species that we, we just don't ha have a lot of people who are aware of it in, in this area because it's not one that we've worried about much. Um, it's so possible that people have seen it and you know just not known and just kind of assumed it to be one of the cool mollusks that live in our state. Um, as far as ecological impacts, um, I, we, did, we did not evaluate that with this particular study. I would say um, these populations are pretty small and pretty limited in geographic range within the lake. Um, so I, I don't know that there's really a big impact happening at this time, but you know we didn't we didn't we also didn't evaluate that. So I don't know if I can say that with a whole lot of oomph other than just kind of a gut feeling that you know, it's, it's a very small part of each of these lakes where, where we're finding these. And even when we've gone out and searched further, we, we don't see them in those other parts um, as of now. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that this project brings up though about, you know, what does that mean for the future? Not only short-term, um, but really thinking about long-term. I had talked about those climate models. Um, this might suggest that we need to rethink what those climate models look like um, if we're really, um, bringing in more about like what actually is suitable habitat now and and that could really mean something um, about you know a, a, the future of Minnesota too and what impacts we should be looking towards. And Catherine has a question that kind of um, is similar to the first but they're wondering how do these clams impact lakes um, so maybe in areas where they're more well established Sure. Yeah. So they're um, they're they're quite problematic, especially in um, southern parts of the United States, um, out in California. I used to actually deal with them when I was doing zebra mussel work in California. I would come across these all the time. Um, their their biggest impact is biofouling. Um, so they um, they can cause impacts for like infrastructure and for raw water users. Um, they don't attach like a zebra mussel would. So it's a little bit different type of biofouling than when we think of a zebra mussel. Um, but they just kind of go to these numbers and you end up with these shells that can clog things up. So some of those power plants that I had mentioned um, are actually already dealing with that and having to spend money on managing curricula um, in like their raw water intakes um, or in within their systems. So it's something that in Minnesota, um, at least private industry is already spending money on managing the species. Um, that's the biggest impact. They're, um, or it's their, their filter feeders. So um, there's most likely um, when they reach certain densities, some of those same impacts that you would expect from other filter feeding invasives. Um, but yeah, like the, the biofouling is one of the, the most documented impacts as well. Thank you. Um, our next question is, will there be a Quibicula Quest in partner with Starry Trek? <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So um, Sherburne Southern Water Conservation District did that. Um, so it's it's kind of happened on a more local scale already. Um, the irony from that was that when they did the um, that particular search, they had provided tools for sediment sampling. And yet the live clam still came up in an aquatic plant sampling rake. Um, so we might kind of have <laughs> what we need for that to happen already. Um, this, this year in 2021 for Starry Trek, we did um, make mention of that again and tried to kind of raise awareness of looking for this particular clam in case it did come up in other rake tosses as well. Um, and have I, I, I've been working on trying to spread the word about excuse me, about this species a little bit more too and trying to have people keep their eyes open for it. So, yeah. 
Yeah. And I like that name too. You might want to yes. <laughs> think about that. Herbicula Quest. It's like that. <laughs> um, this next question um, is asking for the name and locations of the lakes where you discovered these clams. Yeah. Just um, repeat that. Yep. So both of them um, are where are at the public boat launch. One is Briggs Lake. So that's B-R-I-G-G-S. And the other is Big Lake, B-I-G. Um, I know there are many big lakes in Minnesota. So these are both in Sherburne County. Um, so those those are the two. And I, I guess I, I don't know if the question was also wondering about the dead, the dead shells. Um, one of those was like Phelan and Ramsey County. And the other, um, I am not sure if I am pronouncing it correctly, but it was Seneco in Anoka County. Yes, thank you. And yeah, there are many big lakes <laughs> within the yes. state. So <laughs> make sure you're looking at the one in Sherburne County. <laughs> um, our next question is from Angelique. And she's wondering, do you have any guesses as to how these clams were introduced to the lakes or when introduction may have occurred? And related to that, what is the likelihood that other lakes will start getting these clams? Oh, those are all really good questions. Um, <laughs> so for as far as introduction, um, you know, we don't know for these lakes in particular what what happened. Um, there's a couple of ways that they can move around. They do have a free floating larval stage um, similar to zebra mussels. So that is one way some of the same um, modes of transport of zebra mussels would, would be a way that the species could also move around. Um, they are sediment dwellers. So also movement of sediment and even thinking of kind of like small bits. So for example, if you have um, like an anchor on your boat and you have the kind that's kind of like a, a scoop, um, if you are not cleaning the sediment off of that and then you kind of bring it and drop it into another lake, that's one way that you can move aquatic invasive species as well. So any kind of like that sediment movement would be another way. Um, presumably since they seem to be getting wrapped up in aquatic plants like it maybe it's even possible they're moving that way as well I don't I don't know there that's uh, maybe a possibility um, but certainly you know set that sediment movement and um, water movement are two two ways that the species could get moved around um, let's see the last question there was a the third part to that I'm forgetting what it is Yes, that was, um, what's the likelihood that other lakes will start oh. getting these clams? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's maybe the million dollar question. I don't know. That sounds like a really great um, research project or updated modeling work having like just come out of Amy and Robert's talk. Maybe we need to get the modeling experts involved. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think, you know, this this find just spurred so many questions. And there's a couple of answers, you know, that came out of this project. Um, but I think what this project is really doing is guiding a lot more on what the next research steps might need to be. Yes. Um, at this time, it looks like we've gone through all of the questions. 